Good afternoon or evening, wherever you are. I would like to welcome you to this fourth webinar of the EFP and thank you all for joining us. I am Monique Danser, the treasurer of the EFP, and I will host the webinar of today in which Dr. Orly Nir Shapira will be the speaker. Before we start today, I would like to give the word to Xavier Striou, the president of the EFP. Over to you, Xavier. Thank you, Monique. Dear EFP members, dear colleagues, I would like to thank you to have joined these four EFP webinars during the lockdown. I'm sure you appreciated the quality of the lectures. And I, I would like to thank our four speakers for their kindness and their incredible presentations. Thank you, Professor Anton Scudian. And to thank you, Professor Filippo Guadiani. Thank you, Professor Virginie Bordicorti. And thank you, Dr. Orly Nir Shapira. The next EFP webinar will be in two weeks on Thursday 21, not at five like today, but at seven o'clock PM. It will be the first with the Professor Moshe Goldstein, the first of a new session of five new webinars before summers. Thank you again all to be there today and enjoy the lecture. Ali, Monique, it's up to you. Thank you, uh, Xavier. Um, I would like to go on now. As EFP, we have launched stereo sessions in these still difficult times for all of us. Some of us are uh, already preparing to go to their offices uh, slowly, and but we're still having time, hopefully, to uh, attend these webinars. These are live interactive webinars where we invite top experts to discuss several topics to promote science and research and also education and training and thus contributing to the overall health and uh, well-being of all of us. Before we go to the webinar, I would like to explain a few things. The intellectual property of the presentation belongs to the speaker and the EFP, as you can read here. The, um, Dr. Orly Shapira will give her lecture for us for about 45 minutes, and then we will have about 15 minutes for questions. You can ask your questions during the lecture in a control panel, which is on the right side of your screen. Since we are with so many, probably not all the questions will be answered. However, we will do our best. So now I would like to go to the speaker of today, Dr. Orly Nir Shapira. She got her dentistry diploma at 95 and a specialty certificate in periodontology at 99, both from the Hebrew University Hadassah Faculty of Dentistry, Jerusalem, Israel. Dr. Nir Shapira is a past president of the Israeli Society of Periodontology and Osseo Integration. She maintains a private practice limited to periodontology and implant dentistry. Her clinical work focuses on the treatment of periodontal diseases in young individuals, minimally invasive surgery, regenerating procedures of bone and soft tissue around teeth and implants. Dr. Nir Shapira gives already many lectures uh, on the use of local antimicrobials in periodontal treatment, modern approaches to periodontal care, and the importance of soft tissues around implants uh, and guided bone. Uh, regeneration. So now I would like to uh, go over to, to the speaker. The, the title of the webinar of today is the non-surgical periodontal treatment maximizing, maximizing the outcome using personalized approaches. So I would like to invite you Orly to start your presentation and please go over to you. Go ahead. Thank you Monique and good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm very happy to give my presentation today and I want to thank the Federation uh, for giving me uh, this opportunity. Uh, I will talk today about the non-surgical periodontal treatment and how to maximize this stage of treatment for the benefit of our patients. So we will start with uh, Jacob, he's 60 years old. 
is generally healthy and is a non-smoker. And his diagnosis is chronic periodontitis, stage three, grade B. We can all notice that he has inflamed gums. It's, it is obvious that uh, we, it will bleed when we will probe it. And we can also notice that he has alveolar bone loss. So what we can do in our practice to help him and what we can do more for him. In this presentation, I will present ways to assess patient risk to periodontitis. What can we expect from a conventional non-surgical treatment? Uh, I want all of us to be familiar with the variety of adjuncts to non-surgical treatments and to discuss the options of how to tailor a patient-specific treatment protocols. In a project of the Time magazine, uh, they try to define which is the most typical person in the world. And this photo represents it. Now we can understand what does it mean when we speak about an average. Uh, you can agree with me that most of our day-to-day -day patient looks more like that uh, because we treat all kinds of patients from different ethnic group age groups and so on so when we speak about an average results of a treatment it means that uh, it will be probably useful in most cases but not always and not for everyone we know that almost 50 percent of the population uh, suffer from periodontal disease and uh, about 8% of uh, the population suffer from severe types. But what is more important is that although oral hygiene and periodontal treatment had improved enormously during the last decades, severe periodontitis is on the rise. And you can see in this map that it is uh, present in all territories of the world, and uh, some of them very uh, um, prominently has a severe periodontitis. We also should remember that, that the population is getting older and that there are uh, many, many implants that are done with no periodontal treatment prior to that. If we can look on a survey from the UK, we can see that the percentage of edentulous patients is decreasing. And now more elderly patients maintain their teeth and they're having more periodontal pockets around them. So for us, this is a challenge to keep their dentition in function for many, many years. So how can we assess the patient risk in periodontology? We know that genetics and laboratory tests did not prove their accuracy and are not available in, every clean, in everyday clinical life. So uh, what are the clinical tools that can help us to assess the risk of a patient to deteriorating uh, in periodontitis? This is an example for mapping method that was published by uh, Maurizio Toneto and Clive Slang in the University of Bern. Um, you can also uh, see uh, that you have a QR and you can scan it and go directly to this uh, to this place. And I want to uh, show you how uh, we can use it in order to define the risk of a specific patient. So we can uh, say that uh, the, the patient is 55 years old with all his teeth and he has about uh, a 20% of bleeding, and uh, he has four deep pockets, and no missing teeth, and about 20% bone loss. He is healthy, as he, and he is a non-smoker. So in this situation, we see that uh, the risk for him to 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 be in a severe state of periodontitis is low. If we continue, we can take another example, the next patient, about the same age, but he already lost some teeth and uh, 
he has the same number of deep, deep pockets, uh, about the same value of bleeding, but he has um, diabetes and he is a non-smoker. So you can see that in this situation, this patient became in a medium risk uh, for periodontitis. And uh, if we can take another example, we can see a 27-year-old patient that has all his teeth, but he has a higher score of bleeding and six uh, sites of probing depth with more than five millimeters and 50% of alveolar bone loss. So in this case, he is in a very high risk for losing his teeth and uh, we have to take that into consideration when we treat him. Actually now, with the new classification of periodontal disease, we already take into account the risk factor immediately when we diagnose the patient. The grading defines the risk by examining the amount of bonus, either by looking at past x-rays or by calculating the ratio between age to bone loss. We also defined a systemic condition, and now we know right from the start in our patient uh, if he is in a high risk for progression of uh, periodontitis. So now it's very helpful for us to know and to plan ahead. So until the mid 80s, periodontal treatment was very, very simple. Uh, it always includes surgery if we had pockets more than five millimeters. Actually, it was uh, some kind of a malpractice to not perform surgeries on pockets deeper than five millimeters. Today, the map of treatment is different. And now we have, we can perform different kinds of treatments. And of course, we can maximize the non-surgical phase and try to do our best not to go to periodontal surgery if it's not needed. Uh, what are the aims for uh, our first stage for non-surgical uh, probing periodontal treatment? First of all, we want to change the oral habits of the patient. We want to have change in the microbial balance, in the inflammation balance, and we want that we will get some pocket uh, decrease. Uh, but not always it's effective because periodontitis grade C is not always reacting well to this conventional uh, treatment, especially in deep pockets. As you can see in the in this film, we have uh, we we not we cannot always reach. Uh, very, very carefully for them. And we have a peripatogenic flora niches and recolonization. Immediately after we, uh, we clean our mouth, there is recolonization of uh, new bacteria. So what can we expect from a conventional non-surgical treatment? Uh, we can expect that in pockets that are moderate, four to six millimeter, the reduction will be uh, one and a half millimeters. In deep pockets, we can expect that it will be two and a half millimeters. Uh, pocket closure, which means uh, pockets that are less than four millimeter with no bleeding, about 74%. Bleeding on probing, 64% reduction. And the gain of attachment is about half of the change in the probing depth. These are really good results and uh, they are, are they satisfying and, and uh, are they working in every patient? As we said, it is good for the average pay, pers, uh, patient, but not for everyone. So we want to be more personalized and to focus on the need of a specific patient. And we also want to keep it minimal invasive because we want to keep uh, uh, surgery as much less as we can.
So how can we improve our clinical resort, uh, result in this stage? So we will cover some new treatment strategies. First of all, we will discuss about improving our technical, uh, clinical techniques and protocols. We will discuss systemic antibiotics, local antimicrobials, replacement therapy, uh, the use of lasers or photodynamic therapy, and the use of host modulation, uh, all of them in adjunct to conventional uh, periodontal treatment. So first, uh, when we are practicing non-surgical treatment, it sounds trivial, but it is important that we will use the right hand tools and will, that will assist us to get better results. And that includes thin tips, mini curettes. Magnification makes a very big difference in the quality of our debridement and also the use of periodontal bears. And it is important to know that these developments were not investigated and uh, they probably can help us to get better results. All the results you saw in the previous slides did not include uh, researches that uh, include these uh, methods. What about timing of the treatment? We have uh, two options. We can have a quadrant anti-infective therapy, which means uh, oral hygiene instructions, subgingival debridement, and appointment by quadrants. And uh, we can have full mouth disinfection, which means uh, cleaning the mouth or doing this phase in 24 to 48 uh, hours. Uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, protocol has all kinds of changes in it, but um, the, base, the basic idea is that the fact that it finished in 48 hours. Uh, but in, uh, when we compare it, uh, we found that there is no difference between these methods, that uh, we cannot say that one uh, can do better than the other. But I would want to share with you an example. Uh, this young patient that was uh, treated in my clinic uh, with a protocol of modified uh, full mouth disinfection. The protocol included the uh, oral hygiene instruction, of course, subgingival debridement, uh, chlorhexidine um, antiseptics, and chlorhexidine chips. And uh, after eight months, you can notice almost a complete bony fill in the angular defects, a complete pocket closure, and we can say that this, in this case, this treatment was very beneficial and saved the patient regenerative procedures that can be very traumatic in a young age. So we can say that uh, if we want to choose one protocol over the other, we can consider the patient preference. We should consider the disease grading, the medical condition. For example, in, uh, it is very well known that if we are doing uh, the protocol of 48 hours, it elevates the amount of bacteria in the blood. So maybe in medically compromised uh, patient, we will prefer not to do it. Also, we can consider the to tolerance of uh, chair time. Not all the patient can uh, sit in uh, the dental chair for many hours. And the use to add the use of antiseptic or uh, slow release devices of any kind.